thank Tyfa Cooper West for bringing me here and um, the letter form archive. And I definitely check out the pieces that they have there in the back. It's kind of surreal to be speaking here. This is my hometown. Um, and I used to come to this library when I was a student at San Francisco State University, which is where I did my undergrad uh, graphic design education. And that was starting in about 96. So that can give you a little bit of context from where, for where I'm coming from, which is I learned design completely digitally. It was a, a recent uh, uh, transition, but nevertheless, by the time I got to San Francisco State University, just about everything was computers. I saw remnants of other things around, but um, you know, it was Photoshop, it was Quark at the time, if, you, if any of you remember that. Um, and <clears throat> I didn't really think much about how things were done um, before the computer. I was just trying to learn how to use the thing um, myself. Um, I this talk here is kind of a little piece of my film graphic means and what it is, I'm coming at this topic as someone who's been interested in independent publishing um, for a long time now. So um, up on the left there is my first zine that I ever made, first and only zine that I ever made, but <laughs> um, it was made with a computer um, because that's all I knew how to do at the time. It, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to cut things out of paper, cut type out of paper and paste it down. And um, after that I became the art director for Bitch Magazine, and um, the founding art director for Bitch is here tonight, Ben Shaken, and, um, and also one of the editors for Bitch, Rachel Fudge is here, so I'm excited to have them in the audience with me. But I'm really interested in um, media and how it gets out to people, important information that doesn't have the platform it always needs. And of course, um, we're living in a different time now, but print was that medium. Um, the other way that I sort of came into this topic was I'm a bit of a thrifter, and so I found myself collecting books um, like these, which are obsolete design production manuals. And most of these are from the Goodwill, although I will admit that some of them have come from eBay <laughs> um, since then. But um, the bottom line is I would, um, th these books are a dime a dozen at, at the Goodwill, and they are incredible. They show you the amount of tools and time and the number of steps that it would take to create um, a simple brochure or a simple advertisement that we can churn out in 10 minutes now. Um, so it's, it, it was, um, kind, this was my awakening, my true awakening, was these trips to the goodwill, really. Um, so like I was saying, of course, we're living in a time where we can get our messages out pretty easily. Um, we have digital, we have desktop publishing. We have um, tools that allow us to publish our ideas online, whether it's on websites or it's on blogs or it's, of course, Twitter, which might be even the, the biggest, um, the easiest way to get your message out there. At least it is for our president. Um, so, um, but all of this um, is pretty new in the grand scheme of graphic communication. Um, <clears throat> The earliest printing um, reliefs in China and then, you know, printing um, was revolutionized in the middle of the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg. Um, and this was an expensive and time-consuming process that required the work of many people to run the presses, to, um, to put the books together. The, the materials themselves were expensive. We are looking at um, paper and vellum and, and um, just the prep time to put something like that together, only a few, only the precious few were seeing these materials. It wasn't um, until later that, um, that the printing was able to get into the hands of um, the regular uh, person. So <clears throat> the story sort of starts with newspapers. And the reason is that the, um, that the uh, newspaper industry was having trouble with their workers who were striking. They were, um, they were not happy with their, their um, pay and their working conditions, and so m strikes were happening all over the place. Um, <clears throat> at the time, newspapers were using machines like these. This is the um, 
linotype on the left and on the right is the monotype. And um, the one that would have been used most often in the United States is the linotype. And um, you know, there would be many, many people who were running these machines. They refer to themselves as printers. And um, <clears throat> they were very skilled in what they could do, so they could go on strike and put the newspaper in a bad position. The newspaper wanted to figure out a way to um, have a typeset without a union. So they started thinking about, um, they, they were supporting methods of typesetting that went around these unions, and that meant new technology. At the time, that technology was um, not up to the standards of the, uh, these are called line casters is the general term. The typesetting at the time wasn't up to the standards, but it was good enough. So <clears throat> this sort of is the dawn of the cold type era. And cold type um, really just means that it's type that was set without hot metal. And um, letter presses use, um, is that better? Sorry. Um, letter presses use metal that is uh, metal type that is pre-made, but those linotype and, and monotype machines um, actually pour the hot metal at, you know, you type things out, you type out your line, and it pours the hot metal and creates a line of type right then and there. So that's, that became known as hot type. Cold type is any kind of type that is set without the hot metal process. So most of, um, how many people in here are familiar with the term cold type? Just to get a sense. Okay, it's a lot of you, you're, you're type people. Um, so, um, but really, most people think of cold type as relating to photographic type, but actually there are also other kinds of typesetting um, that we'll talk about. Um, at the time, produc the production process for cold type what, or for any sort of design production was, was really quite long. And this is a still from um, my film Graphic Means, but I just wanted to show you the sort of timeline that would happen from concept following all the way down through comps, typesetting, um, output, getting images together, sizing, pasting them up, and um, getting them ready for print. It, it was something that um, was still out of the hands of um, people who just simply didn't have the money. There, um, because, of, because of the newspaper's desire for um, ways around the unions, there were new tools that were being used. And strike on, or essentially typewriters, were those kinds of tools. So um, the, this is called the Frieden Justo Writer, and it was one of the systems that could be used. And um, the difference is that this isn't like any typewriter you've seen. It, it has um, proportional spacing, which means, um, and, I, and I'll show you some images of that, but it's a more refined kind of typesetting with better spacing um, between the letter forms. And so it was passable if necessary. And the reason there are two machines here is that um, an operator could enter, enter the text into one machine and then a, a, a paper tape would come out and that tape could be run through the second machine which would then um, justify and, and get the spacing set up for you. So um, this, was, this was one of the early methods. IBM came out with their first um, typewriter that allowed for proportional spacing which was um, the executive, the IBM executive. And um, they have this sort of sexist ad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and yet, kind of charming. Can't help it. Um, <clears throat> but this typewriter also offered what um, I've read to be called quasi-proportional spacing. So it was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't incredibly refined. But it was much better than your typical typewriter. Here's another ad for the Selectric. I just love that they were already thinking about how people would choose different colors. I thought Apple came up with that, but no, they did not. <laughs> um, here's a later edition, uh, you know, release of the IBM executive. And um, you could justify it, as I said, with it, but it actually required quite a lot of steps, which um, I even tried doing a little of this with one of my typewriters, and um, it was incredibly difficult. Just to give you um, a visual of what proportionally spaced type looks like, 
um, you can see that on the top the type is not proportionally spaced and below it is. And it's simply that, that the type is given the appropriate amount of space based on the width of that character. So you're going to get a better looking document, a more professional looking document, if you're using one of these machines. <clears throat> Here, and I pulled those images from this um, little book. And a lot of times they'd say, oh, th th this whole brochure was set with the executive, you know, just to show how um, impressive the machine was. Um, and this, <laughs> this, is, this is showing how you're going to do your justification. Um, part of the text says, to justify the right-hand margin, the material is typed twice. The first copy is a draft typed within the designer margin um, within the designer margin. In the second copy, space is added or subtracted where, the, where necessary by using the two or three unit space bar or the one unit backspace key. Um, I haven't used it, so I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't speak to how difficult that is, but I, I can tell. It's, I can tell that it takes a lot of planning and thinking. Another strike on machine was the Fairchild lithotype, and um, it offered seven different point sizes as well as a larger selection of typefaces. So that's another thing to think about is, you know, while these, some of these machines could replicate um, hot type better with spacing, you also have this question of typeface selection. Um, and so you can see right next to her uh, this case, and that, is, that, has her, um, that has her typefaces in it. Um, this is a Veritiper, another. So they're calling it an office type composing machine. So these kinds of machines were marketed to offices and smaller businesses that wanted better looking type, but didn't necessarily, and probably were setting enough type that they, it warranted purchasing some sort of system, but also wasn't quite as expensive as a real um, photo type setting machine or hot type. Um, and they often advertise the fact that anyone could learn how to use these machines, which I think usually meant women. That's just me. Um, <clears throat> I also just love this machine because it looks like a monster, especially when they <laughs> advertise it like this. Um, and, and here's another, here's a later edition of that machine. It, they just met, they kept it with that face the whole time. Um, and you can see on the left some fonts. And those, those would just snap in and out on a, I think it was like, it's like a disc that's there in the center. Um, another similar machine, the Coxhead Composing Machine. And you can see it was made by the same manufacturers the, of Veritiper. The machine that really sort of blew all the strike on competition out of the water in the end, however, was the IBM Selectric Composer. That was released in 1961, and we'll come back to that in a little bit, but you can just see on the machine, if you look, the two columns of type, one of them is justified, and she's even looking at a piece of design that has a beautiful A on it, so it must be really refined. So back to cold, cold typesetting um, that is really really, I should say, is photo type setting. Just a little um, explainer on what, how this stuff works. The bottom line is photo type setting um, is based on fonts that exist in some sort of film or negative that have light projected through them and that then, um, and then you, um, and that onto a photographic paper. And as you can see here, we've got a disk of typefaces um, in front of a light source, and then we've got this turret um, lens where you can select different type uh, sizes based on um, how you set that lens. And the only reason, I mean, that prism is there just because of the space within the machine, I think. But then you can see how it's projected onto the paper and printed in that way. The type was really sharp, um, much sharper actually than than um, what people were used to at the time, because they were used to metal type hitting paper, and of course that creates a little bit of slight roughness, a certain texture, which, which of course now everyone loves, but um, I do think there was a beauty in the, 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 cl the cleanliness of photo type. Um, but you can see that if you just, th 
think of the idea, the fact that we've got one font here on a disk that can um, create numerous sizes with these lenses. Well, you've got um, a lot of different type in one little font, and that's going to change um, the face of typeface design because um, you've got one font in a small, you, know, you don't have to have a huge case of type. You, um, it's much more affordable to create typefaces in film rather than hot metal. Um, it's, it's a revolution for typography. The, probably the biggest um, effect was the fact that so many more typefaces became available because of photo typography. And this was a big selling point for a lot of these uh, typesetting systems. Um, here are some examples of the ways that you might find a font, and um, it could exist on um, a negative, on glass, on plastic, and you can see it's on, on a disc or, you know, little cards of film or, you know, the really sort of interesting ones are on these long strips. Well, actually, they're all interesting to me, but <laughs> I just, I love this concept of, of this typeface just unfurling. <clears throat> um, this new technology allowed for um, another really important change in typography, which was the ability to tightly space, um, tightly letter space. And um, I, I, in all fairness, this example is not, I mean, uh, some of this is done with someone actually cutting out letter forms and overlapping. But if you can imagine, um, the light projecting onto a, you know, a letter form projecting onto a photographic piece of paper, you can overlap. You can't overlap two pieces of metal type. <laughs> you can cut the type and you can kern it if you're, if you're really clever, but um, not, uh, not everyone did that anyway. Um, so pretty exciting time typographically. The problem with photo typesetting um, was that it was it was still pretty expensive. So um, a machine like this, um, this was an early photo typesetting system, the Photon 200B. So this one was $62,000 in 1963. So imagine that for, for, um, for 2017. Um, and some of them were more than that. So um, that doesn't even include the cost of typefaces. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to also note in this system, while it was outputting type with, with photo fonts, the, um, there is a typewriter there, a strike on machine, and that was there just to give visual feedback to the person inputting the type. Because you didn't see what you were typing. There was no screen projecting to you what you were typing. So if you made an error, you could at least see it there. And you know, we're so used, we need feedback, even with a even with, um, you know, when you're on a, even with digital design, people want to see some sort of feedback when they click a button. It's the same thing. Imagine you just need that um, little bit of information. It was also just very expensive to purchase type. So even if you weren't buying a typesetting system, if you went to a type shop, which that's, that's where you would get your type, um, it would cost a lot of money just to get, um, you know, the typeset for your advertisement, or imagine a book. Um, sometimes, I mean, you could rack up a huge bill um, setting type for your projects. And I just put this image here. This is an example of what some type galleys look like. This is, you would go to your, um, to your type shop and they would, they would give you, you know, different, you know, various sheets of paper with the type that you spec, um, and then it was up to you to cut those out and put them together onto your layout. And um, I just love this bag. <laughs> it's from the, this, uh, a type shop in uh, Canada. Amazing that the, guy, that the designer kept it. <clears throat> so most people, the people that I want to focus on in this presentation, didn't have money to go buying type all the time, to, to be commissioning typesetting all the time. So they would have to go to um, small businesses to have their, um, to have their jobs printed, and they might use some of the, some of the type that I'm going to talk about in this, um, in this presentation, or they might even just use a typewriter. So I have this church newsletter 
that just shows, you know, they're working with what they have, and that's good enough for this. You know, at some point, you have to you have to sort of make a decision like, what's more important that I get the word out or that this is the finest typography um, that's fit for, you know, Vignelli. Um, so groups like um, small presses, artists, churches. Um, you know, nonprofits, activists. These are the kind. This is how you'll see a lot of their materials from the '60s and '70s. Okay, so back to my one of my favorite machines, which um, is the IBM Selectric Composer. This machine was based on the the IBM Selectric. Which how many of you used an IBM Selectric? All right, a good quarter of you. So this is the IBM Selectric on steroids. It had a lot more features and allowed you a lot more control over, um, uh, over line lengths and justification and, of course, also um, character spacing and word spacing. And people could actually um, get um, a lot, or to, they could, um, I, I can't think of the word, but you could you could get a deal where you could get um, a machine and um, pay for it incrementally. So you could you didn't have to have all the money up front. You could get one relatively easily that way. Um, so it looks as you can see like an IBM Selectric, but a little bit heftier. Um, and they're and, and they, they they vary, but they they have these little. Sometimes there is a dial where you can make adjustments. And, um, and then if you see in the corner there, those are her typefaces, which came in these little type, they're called type element balls. And um, they, um, I always thought they were metal. They're actually plastic. They just look, they just paint them to look like metal. But here's, an, here's a little film that shows the composer in action for those of you who haven't seen it. This is a Selectric. It's, this one is actually the one in my school's office. I, my, uh, the person who um, does all our scheduling still uses it <laughs> for things. So I've started playing with it, and then I had to get my own, so I have my own now. And it's in green, if you want to know. Um, <clears throat> so this was another machine that required you to enter the type in twice. Um, so think about that workload. Um, you're, you're entering it in once, and then you need that second time to deal with um, end-of-line decisions for hyphenation and justification. Hyphenation and justification were like the biggest humps that um, the cold typesetting world had to get through. Here's another image, just so you can see. I think this is a little bit of false advertising because I don't think they had that many, many typefaces. I think that was one of the biggest problems for the perhaps for the composer. Um, so <clears throat> um, most, as you can see, this would be used for body copy. Um, this is their typeface catalog, which they call it their, the, the, port, the composer type portfolio, type style portfolio. You know, and it's pretty impressive. There are, there were a good selection of sans serif and italic, and um, you know, considering this is coming off what looks like a typewriter, it's pretty impressive. And I think in the hands of the right user, you could actually get pretty refined typography. I know, for instance, that someone I interviewed for my film, um, that that's what she used to set type for Key Bank up in up in the Oregon area, up in the Portland area, excuse me. And I mean, you know, it's a bank. It's not, that's not, that's no small potatoes. So um, it wasn't only used by uh, these kinds of organizations that I'm talking about in this presentation, but, um, but it, again, it was, it, was, it was hitting that sweet spot in places that did enough typesetting that they wanted to have something in-house, but they didn't have enough money to pay for um, the, these bigger typesetting systems. This is just a little chart that shows the different letter widths that the composer had. It was seven different widths that they, it had. And it even had a ruling font. 
which is interesting to me because um, most people would have just done this with a technical pen. I, it seems like it would be more work to try to do this with a type element ball, but then again, I never, I've never seen it in use, so I don't know for sure. And then the other thing, just speaking to the, to the quality of the type, um, the, the IBM Selectric uses a carbon ribbon, so the quality is much better. It's pretty impressive when you, um, when you see the sharpness of line that you get with the, with the, compo or the Selectric. So um, this is, these are just comparing the different ribbons. And I had to throw this in because it's Paul Rand. <laughs> and um, their materials, of course, were designed beautifully. And Selectric, the Selectric moved with the times to some degree as well. Um, I mean, they were being used, well, like I said, they're, it's still being used in my office. And that's for things where she wants to add type on top of an existing um, form. But, um, the, uh, but IBM developed um, memory systems so that you could type in a small amount and then go back and make corrections before you printed it out. That's a huge deal. It might only have been a line that you had before you had to go back and make corrections. But nevertheless, you don't have to redo that whole line. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the Selectric was um, used to create the whole Earth catalog, which of course, the, the fun thing about this talk is that so much of it takes place right in the Bay Area. So, um, Stuart Brand, who was the publisher of the Whole Earth Catalog, which started in the late 60s, and this is what the inside looked like. It was um, sort of a reference book, but also a mail order catalog, and um, you could purchase um, items to help you either um, make media or um, DI, you know, live a DIY lifestyle or live off the grid to some degree. Um, it sort of, it definitely lived outside of the mainstream um, sphere. And um, they, they not only used it, but they really sung the praises of the, the IBM Selectric. So, um, you know, in, in true, you know, sh fashion of the time, they had an article on how to make your own Whole Earth Catalog. And you can see her um, using the composer there to set the type. Dry transfer type. So this is probably the most well-known piece of, um, or kind of type setting that, um, that, that sort of came up in, in the middle of the century, and um, that is dry transfer type. And a lot of people gener use the term Letraset, but that's a brand name, so I'll, I'll just refer to it as dry transfer type. And um, basically, it's a kind of type that comes on a, um, on a sheet that can be rubbed down onto paper. And um, it's called dry transfer because the original um, iteration of this product required water. But they were able to develop a version that you could do without water, which, as you can imagine, um, water would have been very difficult <laughs> if you were trying to do page layouts. Um, so this is when it actually became a viable piece of um, type for designers to use. And it was a really affordable product. You could get a sheet of type for not very much money. I don't know exactly, but I, I want to say less than $10. Um, and you could get really good typefaces. So Letraset, um, the company, was translating a lot of metal faces. Um, they were getting, they were getting um, the rights to do this, um, going through the proper channels. They took the type very seriously. Um, and then some other brands were making knockoff um, faces, and um, this is one that I really like, Antiqua Margaret, the Zipatone on the left. Um, and I think it's only been digitized by, it's, I think it was, I, I made some offhanded comment that I read that it was poorly digitized, and then it turned out I knew the person who digitized it, and he's like, sorry, I did a bad job. <laughs> um, but I just, I think it's a beautiful typeface. Um, some, other, some other brand names, Chart Pack and Deca Dry. And while the tool was originally meant for professional users, they quickly realized that this 
product could be sold to people for all kinds of hobbies, um, from model making to use, being used in the office, um, being used at home, being used by students. And they came up with so many different products that were essentially about getting type um, onto different materials. But um, um, this, this is just um, some of those things. And here's a few more examples, and they're just always trying to, sh you know, show you what you can do with all of this, all of this type. And um, also, you know, they 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 were primarily focused on the graphic design um, industry, but they also did a lot with um, for architects and even landscape architects. And here's a system that they um, created that supposedly made it easier to um, set the type. And it says, now you can set your own type quickly and easily. I don't think most people use this machine, this contraption. I think you're probably just better off using the sheets. So here are some examples of dry transfer as used by artists. Um, these are two pieces that I saw at the Tate Britain. And um, I was um, you know, excited to see how these designers, one in, the, in 1980 and then one in 77 using um, this type to share their ideas. So one is, is about feminism, and um, the other piece is advertising the show of um, an artist, Conrad Atkin Atkinson. Businesses that may have had trouble getting their work typeset, perhaps for re reasons of prejudice, they might turn to dry transfer. And um, I have Dan Radigan to thank for even sh you know, bringing this up when we were talking for my film. He's, as, as Tanya mentioned, he's speaking next time, and I highly recommend it. He is the king of dry transfer type. He really knows a lot, and um, he's so passionate about it. Um, but these two examples are really interesting to me. If you imagine you have to set up an ad like the machine shop, and you don't want to take this to someone, you can do it yourself in your own shop. Of course, bands, and particularly punk bands, ended up utilizing dry transfer a lot. And of course, well, I shouldn't say of course. I'm guessing it was out of financial necessity. But of, of course, now, that aesthetic that came from it just um, organically is people try to imitate that. And they try to imitate it digitally, which is the worst. Um, but nevertheless, it's gonna, people are going to continue. Like this, this aesthetic is here, and people feel a very strong emotional connection to it. And it all came about because people finally had type in their hands that they could afford. And I put this in here because it's kind of the, the crown glory of, of, um, of punk typography. And I still don't know exactly. I know that the top type was probably made with um, with newspaper clippings. The bottom type, I don't really know if that is a photostat or what. Um, does anyone know? <laughs> does anyone know about this piece? I gotta find out. There were other means of setting cold type. And um, these were display typesetting machines, meaning that they were for type that was at headline sizes, 18 point and above. And um, these were generally, you know, probably a more advanced user would have access to these machines, either have access to it or actually go to a type shop and get their type set with it. Um, and these machines were um, a big deal because they allowed, again, for that tight, tight, tight um, letter spacing and incredible control. So this is the first of those machines, the Filmotype. And those are um, rolls of, um, those are fonts that are on those reels. But the really, probably the one that you have heard of is the phototypositor. And this was, this was the Cadillac of display type um, setters. It, um, if you can see, she's looking into a little viewfinder that allows her to see the letter forms projected onto the paper. And so she can make decisions about how distant or close those characters are. 
and, um, and you would just put the type onto a roll, and, <clears throat> um, and the type would come out in this long strip, which you could then um, cut out and paste up. And you could also output it in different formats, so on film, positive or negative, paper negative, or paper positive. I think paper positive was probably the most common it just allowed for more flexibility for someone to take a piece of paper and integrate it into a paste up. This, this shows how powerful the machine was. It allowed for the manipulation of type in a way that it had not been able to do, that wasn't possible before. Um, <clears throat> so you could, of course, scale. And, and um, those of you learning typeface design and those of you fine typographers, this may this may feel uncomfortable, but you could stretch the type. You could <laughs> stretch it in all manner of ways. You could backslant it, create italics. I mean, fake italics, of course. You could create curves. I mean, it, you can see that this machine, you know, put in the right hands, you could do some um, really amazing work with it. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the average composing time took two seconds per letter, and the average cost was only two cents per word if you own the machine. At least that's how they calculated it. And um, to give you a sense of how they marketed the machine, um, it basically advertised itself as a replacement for lettering artists. And the note at the top says, all the typography in this advertisement other than the body type was set in the phototypositor. And um, <clears throat> as you can see, they're saying, oh, this thing can work 24 hours a day year round and lease it for $15 a week, another machine that you could lease. And that, t I mean, look at that type for the header. That's pretty impressive. If we're, if we're looking at, that's a typeface. That's not a, a piece of lettering. And I just like this because it's a price list. But there's your price, $2,400 for this machine. And again, you could, uh, you could lease it. So it's, I think, it seems to me like it was a fairly reasonable price for what the machine could do, but still, a lot of people didn't, um, didn't have access to it or, or di didn't have enough money for it, or they thought, I can just letter. <laughs> you know, a lot of people were good at lettering. Another machine was the Prototype, and um, here they're, they note that they have, they offer 25,000 fonts, and I'm assuming that includes styles of one typeface. Um, and it's one of the ones that claims it could be oper e easily operated by anyone. Note that every single person demoing these machines is a woman. I just made this close up because I think, so the, she's, she's projecting the light through the machine. And some of these machines required that you work in lower light. So that's a problem. The, the, phototypositor, you could work in broad daylight because the whole machine, um, all, the, all the chemistry was inside the machine. Um, and then kind of the bottom of the line was the strip printer. And they um, are clearly sort of pointing their finger at the typositor and other machines and how expensive they were and how this, this poor businessman wishes he would have gotten a strip printer. So here are the things they're showing that you can do with a strip printer, which is not as much as, you know, as a typositor. The machine there behind her, I mean, you literally would just move the, just back and forth. You could move the, um, the strip. I mean, I'm sure if you put it in the hands of an experimental person, they could do really cool stuff with it. But this is what they advertise that this machine could do. And here's a little, here's a better image of the machine. So this had to be operated in low light much harder to do a good job of letter spacing, I would say. And there's your price. So very accessible, but probably not the best, not as good of quality and typefaces, not as good. But I think it's interesting that they, they, um, they talk about how the typefaces are, you know, six bucks a typeface. So here's their little comparison. Um, <clears throat> and then this is uh, another machine, which is the Veritype or Headliner. And this machine is on a plastic disc that you could rotate. And um, you could put, you can see she's got sort of two lines of type on there. Um, 
And the way that Veritiper was advertising this is that you could have a whole typesetting department for an affordable price. So you've got your Veritiper for body copy and your headliner for headlines. And I threw in some others that weren't, I don't think they were very common, but I find them interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is the italic Veragraph. And it's actually, um, you can see that there's, there's a pen attached to the machine and there were templates in there that could help you, or that would um, draw out those different typefaces. So it's, it's pretty inventive, but I've never seen an actual specimen of someone having used this. So my guess is it wasn't very good. Um, and then this uh, system, which I actually don't know the name of, but um, I've seen in person, and it's, it's, you just rip off pieces of paper. So the type comes in these little pads of paper that you tear off and put in a composing stick. Um, and then um, there, you, you have some tape underneath and pull the whole line of type or the word off. And then you can paste that onto your board. So that's pretty clever. I mean, it's simple, but it's, it's actually pretty clever. Um, other tools. So this, this talk focuses on typography, but I wanted to share a little bit about what the designer of the 60s and 70s might have in their studio. There was a lot of equipment needed, and um, depending on what you were doing, so this is actually just from one of these manuals of mine, but he's got all kinds of equipment in there from pens to special kinds of desks to um, machines to help him scale his illustrations, um, airbrush equipment, all this stuff could add up. But there were still, um, I just wanted to share some of the things that um, were more um, accessible um, to make design a little easier and um, faster. So Formaline, which is um, part of the, a brand that was did, made dry transfer type, they also created these tapes that would allow you to create rules around text. And they had different um, styles of rules. Um, again, any really fine production designer would not touch this stuff, um, at, at least according to some that I've talked to. <laughs> but you can see that that would be pretty tempting and um, a clever way to add a little bit of spice to your design. Another tool was Letrafilm and or Letratone. So this film was used to fill in large areas on a design. So here we've got green being used, this cut out of this film to fill the shape of this car. Letratone was a version of this product that gave texture. And so this could be a great way to add depth to a design um, without a whole, lot of, a whole lot of time. And especially if you're designing in black and white, texture is going to help a lot. If you don't have the money for color, these kinds of um, tools would allow you to get more mileage out of your design. And here's sort of an example of how that texture might be used. You would cut it out um, to fill the shape that you wanted. Technical pens, anyone could have access to, you know, just about anyone could have access to technical pens. Um, it did require a lot of skill to use a technical pen, so I think that's why Formaline saw um, a niche in the market that they could get into. So who was using these kinds of tools? I'm going to start with, um, I mean, I'm going to focus on the counterculture and the underground publishing. Um, and um, basically, this was a, these tools made it possible for organizations to have um, professional or semi-professional looking materials um, to get their message out. So for example, there was Amazon Quarterly, which was a feminist publication. And um, you, know, you can imagine these tools are coming up at the same time that we're having a, you know, a, a revolution in terms of, um, of politics and um, feminism and um, issues of race. And so it's, it's a per, it was the perfect time for this stuff to come out. Um, so you can see here, Amazon Quarterly is using a lot of Letraset. 
and they also had a section on how to make your own magazine. And this may have just been set with a Selectric, because as you can see, it's, it's a soft rag on the right. Here's some um, covers of publications that were, you know, there was a lot of really nice mixture of um, dry transfer type, illustration, and photography. A lot of times you can see, you know, instead of messing with a phototypositor, which was just trying to imitate some of the cool psychedelic type anyway, they would just draw it themselves. <clears throat> Other, you know, other so gay publications were able to use this without having to break the bank. Um, another, actually, the first magazine was a, a lesbian-focused magazine. This is a feminist-focused magazine. No, this is lesbian-focused too, actually. Um, I like their kind of modernist. Um, header and then it's it feels like it's getting a little more um, playful with that type treatment or that lettering. Oh, that's type. Um, and these publications were a way to share really important information that maybe they people weren't able to get in mainstream publications. Things that we take for granted now, I think. Another publication. Does anyone, did anyone here know about this publication? I love this cover. It's, there's something really sweet and just, man, it stands out. And it's so simple. It's possible that they have this up in special collection. Really? Okay. And it's small, too. I, I, it's, a, it's only about this big. Librarians, radical librarians. And you can see the play with letter spacing. You could also do that tight letter spacing with dry transfer type. And all these typefaces are so popular now, aren't they? I'm seeing them everywhere. Here's a spread from Other Scenes magazine, and I love this person just went wild with the dry transfer. Yes, yes. Some of these are British. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, another thing that was happening at this time, you know, there's this sharing of um, ideas and materials, and um, folks were um, offering their services to typeset. So um, this is an ad saying, hey, do you want your typeset like this or this or this? You could. You could send them your typewritten copy, and then they would send it back to you in galleys. Probably done by a Selectric, um, or they may have had a, a slightly more advanced machine. And it says, needless to say, there are numerous other typefaces in addition to this one. Ten point universe, universe bold, not, not universe. Radical software, which is really more about media and like controlling your own media. And, you know, I, I just pulled these images because of their, first of all, the mix of um, typesetting processes, but just also these political topics that, again, weren't going to be covered um, in, an, in maybe in the, in the way that you would be interested in, in reading about in mainstream press. We're spoiled by our access to now. <laughs> um, Oz was a magazine that started in uh, Australia and then made its way to London. And so this is the first issue of Oz. And it was a, sort of this wild counterculture, politics style, very irreverent magazine. Um, they definitely got in trouble um, and went to had um, obscenity charges uh, called against them, and uh, 
So, but here's an example of them using drive transfer and I think a selectric, I don't know for sure on the body type, but my guess is that it was something like that. My favorite on the left, just this mix of modern type with this bizarrely drawn face. Um, <clears throat> I did email briefly with a designer who worked with them, Pierce Marchbank, and he said that everything was created in-house, and they would supply their, their uh, boards to the printer, you know, hours before printing. So it wasn't like they had some massive, you know, production department. The mixture is what I love. And it's not something I was as familiar with. I, so I grew up um, looking at tons of psychedelic posters, mostly made here in the Bay Area, um, because my dad, who's here in the audience, uh, was in, uh, introduced me to all of that music, and, and he introduced me to a lot of those artists. But I had never seen this kind of thing, this mix of, of type and lettering. It's a little more of this sort of bizarre contrast. Here's more. Here's something about their obscenity um, trials. Another pop, uh, publication um, that was utilizing these materials was the Black Panther, which was designed, or at least it was art directed by the Minister of Information for the Black Panthers, Emery Douglas. So he used photography, dry transfer type, and um, the IBM Selectric, and then a, most famously he, his illustrations, which. Um, have been, um, which I won't show as much here because we're focusing in on the type. But there are sections of the publication like this where you could see that this was done um, pretty simply with um, some sort of strike on machine and either they ruled those out with a pen or they, maybe they had that ruling um, type element ball. I know that he would have to train, you know, whoever could, whoever had a, Whoever was free that could help him um, put the, the paper together. The lines, they're pretty, they're pretty consistent. So yeah, I guess you're right. Although, unless they were very skilled, I don't know. But these are not, I mean, those look like pen lines to me. Yeah, it's very inconsistent. So, I mean, he was working with who could, you know, who he could train and who could, who could help him. But you can see just, the, just in this little small section the mixture of materials. Um, and I was informed by Steve, Stephen Coles, who got to interview Emery Douglas recently, that his preferred um, dry transfer type was format, A, because it was more affordable, and B, because of those guidelines that made it easier to use. Also, they have an awesome logo. Um, and then just a little aside, I just bought this poster recently. And um, well, I saw it in the show at the De Young. How many people went to the De Young show, Summer of Love? There was a lot of good posters in there that I'd never seen. So I happened to see this in a coastal town in Oregon when I was just taking a friend on a tour of Oregon. And um, I love the piece, but of course you can see what I got interested in, which was here at the bottom. And I never noticed this before in looking at these posters, that um, all the ticket outlet information was uh, set with strike on. Because why waste money on that? stuff you know it's like let's focus on the poster and then just put that that other info um, out of the way same with this I just bought a copy of this poster and here it is the, right well this one they didn't really think it through did they yeah so these were both family dog productions which who were, that's the group who put on the show. And there is a little bit of dry transfer type uh, there at the bottom that notes that it's Family Dog Productions. 639 Goff Street. 
And this is a picture I took at that exhibition. Um, is that show still on? Well, hopefully you saw it because they had a, a section all about the production of the posters. And so um, here we can see a film flat and a, and, um, a film and then the finer, final Victor Moscoso print. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> from there, more affordable type setting was still, you know, while all this is happening, of course, technologists are trying to come up with better systems. Um, systems that were smaller than this, perhaps, and more affordable than $146,000. There were some over 300 machines available. This is a poster that is, you know, comes up to here from the ground, on, you know, that I got. It was just tucked into a book that I got. And it gives you all the specs of all these machines. Imagine having to try to purchase uh, a machine in this time. It's not a question of Mac or PC. It's like this or this or this or this or this or that. And they each had different things that they were good at and other things that they weren't so good at. Um, <clears throat> but <laughs> you could definitely, uh, into the 70s, there were some machines that were released by a company called Comigraphic which allowed for smaller type shops to open up and for people to um, afford perhaps getting machine for themselves in-house. Um, so their copywriter and edit writer systems retailed anywhere from $5,500 to $20,000, which in the grand scheme is a lot more affordable than, than um, you know, $146,000. So here's an example of a copywriter and it's um, I don't know if you can see on the actual machine, which is the blue machine, there's, there's like, you get one line of text that you can see as you type it in and you can make corrections. The, um, the monitor connected to it is like a peripheral that was added to help make it easier to set the type. But it all just looks like that green, you know, DOS type. I, I don't actually don't know what it's called, but just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, um, display in any way like the type, the actual type. And I just, this is a brochure of all their um, machines that I like. And it's kind of sad because a lot of these machines, like they don't exist anymore. This, this is a picture I took in Warsaw. This machine was just like tucked into a corner of, of their museum of technology and industry. And of course I was, I just turned a corner. I said, oh my gosh. Um, but nobody, I mean, people were just walking through the room. Nobody knew what it was. There was no signage for it or anything. Um, but why would, you know, no one kept these machines because, because obviously things got smaller and, and easier. And um, unlike letterpress, which those machines, they're like tanks, you know, it's, they keep running. There's, you would have to do a lot to ruin um, a Victorian uh, printing press. These machines, not so much. They were delicate. They had all these um, electronic um, elements that didn't didn't hold up. Um, Lino, Mergenthaler Corp, which created the um, <clears throat> Linotype, created their own more affordable diffusion line, if you will. So this is a Lino Comp, and eight thousand to twenty six thousand dollars in in nineteen seventy four, and I believe that is old Mergenthaler, I mean, sorry, Gutenberg, hanging out by the machine, surveying. And then the VIP is another machine that was popular and affordable, 11 to $19,000. And again, you could, you could lease these machines or they were so popular, the things were changing so rapidly that you could um, buy a used one because someone else had upgraded. So um, a, lot of people, a lot of people were, buying used ones, and then starting their own little type shops. A lot of times you can see in the colophon of books, um, do you know this type shop? Awesome! <laughs> well, I love the fact that I can see in, um, in, I could see in this colophon who, you know, where this type was coming from in Fairfax, California. And uh, this was a graphic source book of materials, equipment, and services. I don't know if you remember that book or if you worked on it, but there it is. I can send you this image <laughs> if you want. Um, 
So these, these kinds of um, <clears throat> systems were making it possible for um, some more refined typography, but still, you know, perhaps out of reach of the folks, of some folks. Um, but really, of course, the game changer was this guy, um, which came out in, t um, I was going to say 2004, 1984. Um, the Macintosh 128K for for about $2,400. And it, of course, it wasn't an overnight switch, but we all know that this was sort of the, the moment that, um, that there was no looking back. Um, and that's another story. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I thought I'd leave you with these famous words from Stuart Brand, stay hungry and stay foolish. For those who have a, a passion in independent publishing, these, these words never cease to be relevant. And um, again, a lot of this is just me um, expanding from the film Graphic Means, which, as Tanya mentioned, will be screening in on November 14th at the Roxy. Um, and I thought I could just show you the, the um, trailer uh, before I say goodbye. Whoops. No. I don't think people today realize how mathematical and detailed the whole construction of pages was and still is, it's just done behind the scenes for you automatically. It must be obvious now to those of us employed in the graphic arts that we will, in the next five years, undergo more changes than any other industry in the history of our country. If you look at the evolution of printing, there were many reasons why phototypesetting overtook hot metal. For it is by tape that future equipment will be reached. You would ring the typesetter, you would name your typeface, you would read the text over, and you would get it back. There was no WYSIWYG. You couldn't see what you were doing. It was just a bunch of codes. Sometimes it came back the way you envisioned it, and sometimes it didn't. The important thing is not to panic. Whatever you've lost, it's around here somewhere. I hated doing pay stuff. I was terrible at it. Today, the printed word is expressed and executed with technological advancements never dreamed possible even a few years ago. Any new technology is always going to have reactionaries, and it's going to have experimenters, and it's kind of wonderful to see both things come together. It's amazing how quickly the technology changed from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. Hello, I am Macintosh. All of that old technology, just gone. Well, what are you going to call this new invention? And I blurted out, well, we might call it desktop publishing. Being able to directly manipulate type, photography, color, that's what it's all about. That's the revolution. You could actually design a typeface on a lark. This is the first one that I did, this one, block. Up until 1960, 70, if Gutenberg came back, Gutenberg would have been comfortable in that studio. The studio now? Well, well, the amazing thing is, this is the studio. That's it. All right, thank you very much.